Shakedown is back in the studio today, recapping F1, IndyCar, Global Rallycross, and previewing the Le Mans 24. Getting ready for this weekend's Drive 25-hour live stream viewing party showy thing. And of course, at the end of this show, I have a question for you asking about F1 versus all the other racing to confirm or deny my appreciation that F1 is the pinnacle of the racing sport. You know, Shakedown in the studio is not as dynamic as being at the races or in a race car. But in the studio or in the field, getting good shakedowns done, sometimes for me, is kind of tough. The Detroit shows freak me out more than you know. But when that happens, I have a little trick that gets me back online. When you see the camera, don't you get too scared. Just grab your camera buddy and say these magic words. Fuck you, camera. You can suck my I promise we'll talk Montreal F1, but let's start with IndyCar. They ran at the Texas 1.5 mile, 24 degree banked oval, a track just like Vegas where Dan Weldon passed. But this year with the new car, a ton of driver input, IndyCar listening to drivers, how about that? And the drivers dialed in a downforce package that put the car back in the hands of the drivers and made tire degradation a strategy factor too. Wasn't the Indy 500 aero package, but a hybrid of it. So the slingshot passes we saw at Indy were not there. But the racing was. Pack racing was gone, but the side-by-side still existed. Driving and tuning the car setup made lead changes and the ultimate outcome pretty exciting. Graham Rahal continued the new IndyCar tradition of crashing a wall in the final laps. And Justin Wilson, the second guy in this picture, took the win after Ganassi and Penske, those juggernauts, they missed the mark as well, like everyone else except Wilson. I gotta start changing my tune on this Delara car. Ugly or not, it's making for beautiful racing. I talked with Wilson, a bit at Detroit. (laughs) Shouted up at him, actually. He's pretty damn tall. He explained to me how the front and rear of the car is starting to work together. Now, CEO Randy Bernard came out of a great Indy 500 with the bad PR of an owner overthrow uprising, which by Detroit seemed to have been more bluster versus reality. A car cost out of control controversy. Bitter words about the handling of the engine parity plan, which translates to Chevy's now pissed because the updated Honda now looks good and the Texas race promoter, Eddie Gossage, calling the IndyCar drivers pussies because they didn't like that the track fence poles were still on the inside of the track, and it was a pole that Dan Weldon's helmet hit. And now a will it happen or not problem slash controversy with the August China race, the streets of Jingtao. But Randy's a good pro. He's a planner. He knows marketing. He's organized. And he's gonna bring in a veteran racing consigliati like Derek Walker, who gave me one of these when we met at Detroit to go with his other racing operators, Bo Barfield, the race director, Will Phillips, VP of technology, and all the others. Randy and his team have got IndyCar working better than it ever has in a long time. And that Detroit GP, well, I love and respect Roger Penske like we all do, it was his mess, not the IndyCar series. For what it's worth, I shook Randy's hand and volunteered my support, if just for moving on from Danica. But I guess my best support for Randy is this advice. Randy, if the owners ever get on your nerves, just remember, when you see the owners, don't you get too scared. Just grab your owner buddy and say these magic words. F*** you owners, you can suck my d-. How about Global Rallycross that also ran at Texas? Jumps and drifting, shortcuts and fender banging, all as a prelim to the ESPN X Games coming whenever. Marcus Grunholm and his Ford Fiesta won the aptly titled for me, Hoon Kaboom Texas Race beating back Tanner Faust and the other drivers in their Subaru, Hyundai, Dodge Dart, and Saab. And I guess these are real racer athletes. Travis Pastrana separated his shoulder. Watch the video link in the description below and hold your thoughts about this type of racing. I got a question for you at the end of this show. Time to go to Montreal, Canada and talk F1. Okay, it's real simple. The F1 show is awesome. The F1 package is complete. It's got sport, glamour, personality, technology, stories, backstories, drama, and characters. And I say that not because of now, we have seven winners in seven races. It's how the results are happening. And behind the winners, the excitement of new talent, Grosjean and Perez in Montreal, Maldonado in another race, Lotus, Sauber, and Williams nipping at the heels of the Giants, and Ferraris re-emerging. Hamilton proved his mettle, and that Montreal is a McLaren track despite Botton's lost in the field performance. And Alonso, who got close, defended the Ferrari one-stop strategy. 
but doesn't yet have the Ferrari that manages tires like the Lotus. And then there's Vettel with their double modified RB8. They put on a show too. They had to plug the Monaco holes in the rear floor and the holes in the front spindle brake wheel configuration as it was ruled the design wasn't just cooling, but energizing the air, pulling it, I think, past the front wings to make more downforce, making the assembly an illegal, movable aerodynamic device. But still, he fought for the lead. And, I, and like I said earlier, I like Grosjean and Perez, they showed up as winners too. A ton of cars have the speed, but it's maintaining pace over the tire stint or the race distance that is the 2012 F1 Challenge. Overall, let me say, I hate DRS. Those passes at Montreal were too easy. No need for it anymore with the cars, drivers, and the tires. And I'm actually liking the Pirelli tire thing as the teams figure out the balance. Tire temp management, getting the front and rears to work together, staying within the right temperature performance range. You know, these Italian tires are like every Italian girlfriend I've ever known. You treat them right and they deliver. Push too hard and it's all over. They never forgive and you can't go back. So I'm watching the US Fox TV Montreal broadcast. I got the official F1 timing and scoring going on and it's all good. And then I'm thinking, wow, I wonder if the Sky Sports and BBC TV immersions with their fancier tricks and deeper programming make this F1 thing feel even more top of the mountain of racing. Hold that F1 thought as we finish today with the Le Mans 24 preview. Because A, it's this weekend. B, the whole drive crew is prepping for our live stream orgasmatastic viewing party and live chat spew fest. And C, if anything is going to compete with F1 for global pinnacle status, it's Le Mans World of Dirt's championship racing. Each year they gather to endure the most punishing trial in motorsports, to test the will of man, to brave the elements, to challenge the laws of physics, to answer one question. Can they stay awake for the entire race? Don't look at me. I just wrote the copy. I'm just the guy in the back. That's great. Go ahead. Do it. I, I, do it. Come on. This year, join Drive for the 25 hours of the 24 hours of the month. I thought it was a shakedown. What do you want? I, I thought, wait a minute. I'll be you, over at the information desk. Oh, help me out. They had the Le Mans test last weekend, and it's clear, any sandbagging aside, if you check out the practice timesheets in the links below to see the battles that we're going to enjoy together this weekend. In P1, Audi versus Toyota. 325 was the fastest Audi e-tron time. Sim Raceway's Alan Manish got it, and he's going for, what, four Le Mans? Toyota's two seconds back, now painted blue because that's the official Toyota hybrid color. Just look at any Prius badge. The gas P1s are 10 seconds back of the hybrids. Both bigger fuel tanks versus diesel and hybrids, so that means less pit stops for them. Here comes the math. 75 liters, 16.5 gallons for gas cars. 73 liters, 16 gallons for the Toyota gas hybrid. 65 liters, 14.3 gallons for the Audi Ultra diesel and 71 liters, 15.6 gallons for the Audi e-tron diesel hybrid. I want to see how the dome performs and this Pescarello in particular. In P2, they're in the 340s range and there are a ton of cars fighting the Nissan versus HPD Honda battle. The Delta Wing, by the way, hit the target times in that P2 range as it was mandated. And Delta says there's more speed if they were unleashed. GTs are just in the sub four and four oh point something range. And it's US Corvette versus the Euro Ferrari teams versus Porsche, including the US Lizards and factory Aston Martins are lurking. We'll have all the info, insights and race breakdown during the Le Mans 24 show this weekend. Allowing me to bail on a Friday shakedown because I need to study up. So instead, you take the time to also study up as I will be or watch an earlier shakedown. It's not like they get rotten with age. I mean, they just start and stay the same fermented, almost gone bad ripeness. Ha ha ha. And click the links below to get your Andy Blackmore designed 2012 Le Mans 24 Spotter's Guide. This year sponsored by Sim Raceway. Okay, time for the question of the show. We spoke F1, IndyCar, Global Rallycross, and Le Mans. And I'm saying F1 is the pinnacle of motorsport. You put all, they put all the pieces together, the quality of drivers, the cars, the venues, the show, the broadcasting. I say it's number one for all that. But what about Le Mans? Or the extreme stylings of something like Global Rallycross and X Games? Are they deserving of being a pinnacle? Le Mans 24 has more manufacturers. Global Rallycross is in, maybe more in touch with today's viewers and fans. What do you think? And think about it this way. 
If you want a non-racing fan to think of racing, what image do you want them to conjure up? F1, Le Mans, Kenny Block, Indy, NASCAR? Stew on it. And if I've made the question too tough for you, don't freak out, just remember this. When you hear the Leo, don't you get too scared. Just grab your Leo buddy and say these magic words. Fuck you, Leo. You can suck my d